Next to her is Andrea Smith from the United States. Her word is provoker. I can see some smiles out there. A feminist thinker and anti-violence activist from the Cherokee Nation, Andrea has garnered international respect for her advocacy on violence against women of color, specifically Native American women. She's the co-founder of Insight, Women of Color Against Violence, and the uh, Boarding School Healing Project. Andrea currently teaches in the Department of Media and Cultural Studies at the University of California, Riverside. Um, she teaches uh, American, sorry, uh, yeah. <laughs> and in Michigan, in Iron Arbor. Uh, well, in terms of the theme of breaking the cycles, my approach to it has changed uh, based on my years of working against violence against Native women. So back in the days when I was working in the nonprofit industrial complex, there was this emphasis on kind of individual healing. Um, what can I individually do to break the cycle? And it came out of a space of seeing what uh, the generations of colonial violence had done to our communities and wanting to be the generation that would stop that. Uh, but the negative impact of this is that that approach became very individualized. So we said we're going to go from victims to survivor to healer. And consequently, when we became in the movement, we were supposed to be these idealized healers who were no longer victims. And we also tended to divide the world between victimizer and victims as if the two never intersected. So we would have people in our movements who were still being victimized by violence, but they couldn't talk about it because it wasn't okay. You were supposed to have healed before you joined the movement. Or we would have people in the movement who were victimizing other people, but nobody could talk about that either because it would make our movement look bad. So the consequence of this is that uh, we ended up creating kind of this idealized movement of who we were supposed to be rather than who we actually were. This then ended up getting kind of co-opted by the state because the focus then became on how can I show that I basically put a band-aid on things and I am adapting to a colonial system rather than actually decolonizing the system itself, right? So what would end up happening to the movement is kind of the state would come in and say, you know, little ladies, it looks like you all have a problem with violence, and we're going we're gonna to help you solve that problem with a federal grant. Of course, when you accept the grant, you accept all the stipulations that go with this grant. So we're not going to fund any uh, uh, rabble-rousing, unseemly activities. No, the problem is you are uh, uh, victims and you need healing from somebody with a PhD or an MSW, right? You can't do it yourselves. Uh, we need to solve the problem for you. <laughs> and if you're going to do any activist work, we want you to work with the criminal justice system by calling for longer prison sentences, more police involvement, because as it so happens, we are building up the prison industrial complex and want to co-opt your feminist rhetoric to support our repressive anti-crime agenda. <laughs> So we can kind of see the consequences of this even yesterday at the um, introductory uh, uh, things that we saw at the appropriately described Museum of Civilization, where the Canadian government informed us that they are going to solve the problem of violence against indigenous women. Uh, but, <laughs> The problem with that is that Canadian state is itself violence against indigenous women, right? So if the Canadian government wanted to solve the problem of violence against indigenous women, it would have to dismantle itself. So, so, so that is why we will not turn to them for the solutions, but we'll intend Instead, we will turn to ourselves, because we, what we need to do is not simply heal, but we actually have to dismantle settler colonials and white supremacy and heteropatriarchy. It requires a healing movement that will actually dismantle these structures. So this is when I started to see that we couldn't look at healing individually anymore. Healing happens on a collective basis. I'm not going to heal myself out of heteropatriarchy. I will do it with all of you as we together start to create not just a different world, but create ourselves as different people in this different kind of world, right? So this then showed to me, one, we need to focus on movement building, 
but we need to do movement building in a healing way that's not built around an idealized version of who we're supposed to be, but who we really are. And as we build a movement to dismantle these structures of oppression, we also simultaneously create the world we want to live in so that we have something to replace it with. Right? So this requires kind of an integrated mind-body-spirit framework that builds a holistic movement for change that is also simultaneously so much fun that people can't wait to join. <laughs> I wonder why they use the word provoker. <laughs> I, you know, I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. I, uh, I want to turn it over to the panelists to talk to each other, but I, one of the things that interests me is two parts of what's come up. On one hand, especially turning to Fatima Manisi, was to talk about somebody who influenced you and, and what what some of those women are or what you hold to when you look at yourself and you see yourself moving forward in the movement. And I think the other part is attention, right? There's attention with using, not just using the ideas, but where we're located. Whether I think of myself in the law school, even the term activist, how do you use these terms simultaneously engaging in one space to break through, break down barriers, to move forward, and at the same time seeking to be inside these spaces to transform those spaces, to even use those spaces as platforms to leverage something else. I mean, we heard it even in the beginning, in the introduction today, there's this huge tension um, that we face in, in engagement. And so um, I guess those two pieces, either of which might appeal to you, I'd be interested on one hand knowing a bit more about who you would see as, as thinkers or women, models, mentors, spiritual guides that, have, that hold you when the challenges are really getting tough, um, that are your guiding light. And I guess that other piece of as you're in that space and, and reflecting on that and making choices, how you navigate that tension, it's there. So I'll turn it over to whoever wants to. Well, in terms of the nonprofit industrial complex, now I'm in the academic industrial complex, but I think, um, well, actually, we did a conference, The Revolution Will Not Be Funded Beyond the Nonprofit Industrial Complex, to kind of discuss these issues. And so we see how the nonprofit or the NGO system really constrains our ability to develop kind of mass movements for change, right? Because you get funded by funders rather than the people you supposedly represent. Uh, then the people who rise to prominence in your movements are those who can write grants, who can schmooze with the Ford Foundation, et cetera. And actually, in sight, we actually got defunded by the Ford Foundation uh, over the issue of Palestine. Uh, they, gave, they promised us $100,000 and then they withdrew it when they saw we were in solidarity with Palestine and that's when we learned the revolution will not be funded. But what we also learned uh, from that experience was uh, we actually were able to get the money on our own. We just started doing grassroots organizing and we realized we didn't need the Ford Foundation to do our work and actually the foundation mode had trapped us into a certain way of doing organizing instead of being more res resourceful about how we do the work. So and with that, we then started to open up kind of the dialogue about what are different ways to do the organizing. And what we learned is that in other countries, it's not like people never get a grant, but they don't do the movement building through the nonprofit, right? They build an independent movement that funds itself, and then they may get a front nonprofit to get a specific grant on this, that, or whatever, but the nonprofit answers to the movement, it's not the movement itself. So I think what that speaks to is the need to not think that there's a pure space to do work where you're not implicated in evilness, but if you're working in the academic industrial complex, the nonprofit industrial complex, whatever, can you also have your foot in an independent movement that one, keeps you more accountable when you're operating in these spaces, but two, also gives you more power to operate within these spaces. And similarly within the academic industrial complex, the problem we tend to have is that we talk about um, how racist, sexist, and evil it is, but we don't think of an alternative to it. So this is why we don't get anywhere, because they don't think we're going anywhere, right? And we, and we forget that the reason why we have ethnic studies or indigenous studies is not because the academy one day said, oh, gee whiz, we're racist, we should improve ourselves. 
No, it's the result of mass movements that force these things into the universities, and then we immediately cut ourselves off from the very movements that actually got us power there in the first place in order to become respectable. So consequently, instead of tying all our visions into reforming the academic industrial complex, we can also build alternatives to the academic system, and that's what we're doing now uh, with the Critical Ethnic Studies Association, where we're building alternatives to the academic industrial complex. So I get, again, in summary, then I don't think the issue is that there's a pure space to work where we won't be tainted by anything, but we can work in these places more intelligently if we also invest in independent movements where we fund ourselves and we build our power, because to quote one activist, Barbara Major, when you go to power without a base, your demand becomes a request. <laughs> Remember that one? Okay. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be the first phrase that we're going to hear that's going to really resonate, right? Um, actually, what you were saying made me think about uh, kind of the genesis of a lot of women of color and indigenous organizing, which is in reaction to all this evilness you have to deal with. We wanted to build a safe space for women of color only to find ourselves in perpetual smackdowns that were even nastier in, than in the larger society. And what this made me start to realize was that women of color organizing wasn't actually a safe space. It was actually the most dangerous place that we could do this work. Because the way that the system oppresses us is that it doesn't just oppress us, but that the way we think to survive is at somebody else's expense. So for instance, how do Native people survive colonialism? We join the army and fight uh, militaristic wars abroad. What do people do who are fleeing U.S. imperialism? They come to the U.S. and settle on indigenous lands. It's not because we're bad, but the system has set us up to be against each other. And consequently, if we want to be for each other, we have to undo this, right? So we cannot assume alliances. We actually have to kind of create these alliances. And somebody was telling me, I'm not very literary, but somebody was telling me that the first line of this, the Wild Sargasso Sea says, um, they say when trouble comes, close ranks, and so the white people did. Well, they do that very successfully, but we don't. <laughs> we disperse when trouble comes. We say, not me, go get that person, right? So it takes us a lot of effort to kind of undo this tendency to not be allies with each other. So when you were speaking of capitalism, it reminds me of this uh, great article by Glenn Coltart, who's Dene, who was talking about how we tend to say we're for fighting for liberation and self-determination and sovereignty, but actually what we fight for is recognition. So if we look at our handy diagram of global oppression, which none of you can see, we live in a pyramid system, right, in which 5% of the population owns 95% of the wealth. And the bad news is they have all the money and the guns, but the good news is there's a lot more of us than them. But if we want to change the system, we have to get the 95 mobilized to work with each other. But what the state does is say, hey, indigenous peoples, if you can prove to us how cool, interesting, and spiritual you are, we will recognize you. Right? We will give you special grants or funding, right? And we, they promise this to all these little groups. So in order to get our little grant, we have to say we are actually much more cool, interesting, and spiritual than those folks. Don't recognize them, recognize us. And we end up being in competition with each other rather than working with each other to dismantle the system, right? So a lot of this requires kind of undoing the politics of recognition. <laughs> And then I would just maybe on a personal note say on like kind of what makes me keep working even when things seem really bad is actually my big inspiration is my nephew. Uh, about 10 years ago he was hit by a car and he was given a less than 1% chance of survival and he was told even if we, he did survive he would be essentially a vegetable. He would have no, he would be essentially in a permanent comatose state. And yet, we deci he decided to fight those odds, and now he just graduated from high school three weeks ago. And Yay! So, what he reminds me of is that the only reason Native peoples are alive today is that the previous generation saw the overwhelming odds against them and chose to fight anyway. Right. So how can we do any less? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. Well, um, I think one thing I learned was back when, back in the nonprofit industrial complex, I was the Women of Color Caucus Chair for the National Coalition Against Sexual Assault, 
And we always seem to do this caucus approach to organizing. We were always women of color, the LGBT caucus, whatever the caucus was, where you are part of a larger group and you yell at them for being racist, sexist, homophobic, or otherwise problematic. And then if you're very good at yelling at them, they pay you to yell at them, right? So we would get paid every year to yell at them. And it would often become financially lucrative, uh, but they didn't actually change, right? So this is how Insight kind of developed, where we said, you know what, we don't need to be fighting them. We can just do it ourselves. But I think that's one of the issues of oppression, is that we often get comfortable in our powerlessness, and we yell at other people and ask them to do something. But it's more uncomfortable to say, we're going to do it. We're actually going to build the future. Because when we screw up, we have nobody else to blame but ourselves, right? So moving to a position of power to say, we're going to take this on. We're going to build the world we want to do. But once you get used to that, you realize we don't have to keep yelling at everybody else. We have the power to start being creative. We, ha we have the ability to create the future. And then in doing that, it just creates a different kind of space about doing the work where it's less antagonistic and kind of more positive. And in particularly, I learned this from the indigenous movements in Latin America that focused on, we're not going to just focus on taking power and contesting state power. We're going to squeeze out state power by creating the world we want to live in now. And I also it, ironically learned this a little bit from the um, Christian right, because in my other life I also researched the Christian right. And I would go to the Promise Keepers movements. This is this huge evangelical men's movement. And they'd have these huge stadium events, and you would, they would be singing and dancing, and everybody's eating hot dogs and Cracker Jacks. It was kind of lots of fun, and everybody was really nice to you. And you know, poor Stan had a problem with pornography. They didn't yell at him and say he's going to burn in hell. You know, they'd say, Stan, we want you to be the Christian you want to be. We'll, we'll be behind you. Well, then when I would go to a, movement on the, a meeting on the left, the meetings lasted four hours long. The chairs were uncomfortable. There was no food, and everybody yelled at you for being counter-revolutionary. <laughs> and then we wondered why nobody wanted to join, right? <laughs> so, so this is when I realized, you know, <laughs> We cannot just organize for the revolution in the future. We have to make the revolution now, right? Because if you organize in this intense way, right, you know, I'm going to have no life. I'm going to work 20, 100 hours a week. Pretty soon you're going to get burned out and run off to the shopping mall, right? So consequently, instead of leaving our lives to do the organizing, we had to change the way we lived our life so the life itself was the organizing, so our lives itself was the revolution. So. So I think when you do that, it puts you in a powerful and creative space, but also puts you in a sustainable place, right? Because you're not just waiting for something to happen, but you're getting it now, right? So this is kind of how I, I see the future as something we create now. Mm -hmm. Yay! Yeah.